brought to you what uh, I did when I was uh, working and consulting in Google. Uh, and I work with Gil Shamir, and he actually introduced me in many of these topics. Uh, there will be some work at the end that Moxen, uh, we did with Moxen, and you will hear Dr. Heideri three talks in May, and some work that I did with my friend Philip Jacquet, as well as my former postdoc. Jason Sitara. Okay, so here are the topics. It's a long talk, but we should man manage within a year, <laughs> within an hour. I want to say something about science of AI. How do I understand it? A very generic statement. And then we go into more technical issues. I tell you what I mean, online supervised learning, which might be not the best dichotomy, but that's how I'm gonna look at it. Then we'll look at the foundation of regret for logistic regression, but I will tell more than that. Then I tell you how to realize it by proposing to you low complexity Bayesian regression that we did with Gil Shamir. And then we move to learning, future selection, and a little bit of quantum. But you will hear, you will have two lectures of quantum by Dr. Padakandla in about two weeks. The next two weeks is Dr. Turovsky, but after that, and uh, Markson will also give you some other. So basically, point number five is I briefly introduce it, but you will hear much more later. So let me start with a general overview, my personal overview on challenges of AI. We all know that AI technology shapes the world that we are living in for good and for bad, but it is less recognizable that there are fundamental limitations and the question how to overcome. Some of them are fundamentally difficult because it are on the boundary between mathematics, computer science, and social uh, science, which is always hard when people are involved. Let me give you some examples. In medical profession, doctors will not use AI unless they can have a clear understanding how the inference happened. Of course, they are much more concerned if they make a mistake that, that it helps them actually to do a good diagnosis. So uh, a clear understandable inference from data is important. And they are not interested in lossy compression. They're interested in lossless. They don't want to lose any data because they don't trust us. And another application is with a physical system, let's say autonomous cars. Uh, the problem is uh, that unless we can understand and verify constraint and safety properties, it won't be used very broadly. In social processes, right now, uh, uh, right now, AI is trying to be used for recommending prison sentences. But the problem is how you can understand fairness and other things. This is actually a big question. Finally, corporations are reluctant to use AI unless privacy and security are really the top issues. So there are a few problems which are again on the boundary between uh, AI and social sciences that needs to be taken into account. You may remember that uh, last time I talked, I gave you this data, the triad from data to information to knowledge. It was mostly of data science, but AI can be viewed the same way. And it has to be based on very fundamental and well understood pillars like data, information, machine learning, complexity, logic, inference, and so on and so on. So data is still well understood in this situation, 
but we might deal with classical quantum. We have to understand how to sample, not to oversample or undersample. Information, I spent quite a lot of time discussing the last time. And I told you information could be viewed like a distinguishability, a measure of distinguishability. And in AR, you have to know what you can learn. What are the limits of the, your learnability? But the most difficult part is the knowledge part or information action, because here you have to understand pretty subtle issue of fairness, privacy, trust. Try to understand trust for yourself. How are you gonna understand it? We have some working definition, but far from a good one. For example, this part is very important if you want to build AI for, AI for misinformation. There, there with the misinformation, you have all of this stuff, which we more or less know how to do it. Instead of information, we have misinformation. But the question of the social part, privacy, trust, fairness, is uh, where the people have troubles actually to do it well. And I think we need to find some foundation. Okay, so there are a few issues that I want to start, but let's go to something that uh, it's easier, it's more mathematical, so it's easier to formulate. And let me start with first online learning setup, a very general one. What, what we have, uh, when I was working in Google, we work in ad uh, system. So what is there? They are trying to guess consumers' future buy. So based on, and they do it online. They look at the list of uh, items, both so far, and based on that, they try to predict what happened next. And this is online all the time happening. So in general, you have rounds, T from one to capital T. You want to predict level, the future level that you don't see based on what you saw so far, plus based on some features which we denote by X, up to time T. And it could be anything. It could be habit. It could be some psychological model that we have. Any, anything that you can think of. And of course, Google is very good in trying to uh, guess. Uh, and this, you, you can have infinite number of features, so it's also limited. But that's what it is. So based on this, there is an algorithm that predicts the next level, we call it YT hat on the next slide. And then your customer actually click and you see whether your prediction was good. Usually it is not. So you incur some loss and you want to minimize your loss. That's what we're gonna to discuss today. Uh, so a little bit about notation. Instead of N, what I usually do it, we will use T by the round and we say capital T round. When I write Y to the power T, the vector of T elements, I use both XT because each of this element X1 is a D dimensional vector. Okay, so this is the notation. So let me describe more precisely the model. And I spend a little bit of time of this because I want you to understand the essence of the problem, not the results that much. So this it can be viewed like online learning game. So you have a learner and you have a nature. Nature in the ad system was a customer, a learner was a Google trying to guess it. And each round, we receive a d-dimensional future vector xt and we make prediction why it has. So we predict that the next item that somebody wants to buy will be a book. And then the true level is revealed. Now, I want to make it clear that what you understand. I will only consider levels, binary levels, minus one or one or zero and one. Why has the prediction 
is a variable from zero to one or from minus one to one. It's not a binary, it's a continuous because the regression is about continuous approximation, okay? So once the label is revealed, I have a loss, which we don't know by L. We mostly restrict to logarithmic law, but not only. And this is where I want to spend some time. So you want to see how good you are over a long run. At the beginning, you will be making a lot of mistakes. So there are two components of this regret, point-wise regret. The first one is total loss. Your algorithm incur over time t. That every time I have, I, I guess it right or not, and I'm incur loss. The problem is that this sum or this quantity by itself tells you very little. The only thing that you can get is that it probably is of order OT, but that's not the problem. You always want to understand why, how it is, what is the best you can do in a realistic environment. By a realistic environment, I mean, you have to compare it to something, something that is feasible. So in compression, the first part is basically the, the length of your uh, compressed file, but it doesn't tell you much how good it is unless you know to what to compare. In compression, Shannon told us that you want to compare to entropy. Even if you don't know how to compute it, you know clearly that you cannot beat uh, entropy. In learning situation, it's much more complicated. So let's look at the second term. The second term here has nothing to do with algorithm. It's basically, you can view this like, a, I have a set of expert F, capital F, calligraphic F, and they are making predictions. And I actually, and that what they incur, incur, how much load they incur. F of XT is the prediction made by one expert, let's say F expert. I want to do it, I want to compare to the best expert over a set of experts. So let's see again what we are doing here. The first part has algorithms and basically tells me about how good the algorithm is, but in order to compare it and not try to have silly expectation, I have to compare to something realistic. And the realistic comparison in information theory compression, it was entropy. Here is the loss, the, 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 the best loss or the smallest loss that you can get from a class of experts. Okay. Today, my class of experts is very simple. It be parametric and actually will be one F, which we own the form of logistic regression, but it doesn't matter. You, I hope you understand what we are doing. That the regret that we want to compute. We want to make it as small as possible. What will be interesting is that this regret depends on the structure of the class of experts. Whether my class of experts is a Lipschitz function, or maybe has, has bounded derivative, second derivative. This will actually change the overall growth of this function. Okay, we do one more. I want to be independent actually of almost of algorithms. I want the best possible prediction for the worst possible level sequence. This is called maximal minimax regret. But I should add that it's minima, maximum minimax we get from for fixed design. What do you mean by this? You see, I actually uh, maximizing, it looks like I know uh, everything up to time t. I don't do the maximization, minimalization for every time t and try to find the most 
uh, unfriendly uh, input. So, and for this one, I try to so kind of agnostic sequential. Here, I'm assuming that basically I know feature from the beginning up to T in advance, okay? I'm not gonna, every time I make a prediction at small T, I'm gonna choose the worst features, try to find what's happening. It turns out that these things are related, but this is probably for another talk. What I will try to compute today is this. What is important about this, this is a universal lower bound. Because you see, I'm minimizing over all predictions. And this is actually universal lower bound, as we know also, for uh, agnostic and sequential regret, which I'm not gonna spend much time. Any question? Okay. So this is first online. We also will discuss supervised pack learning. Here, situation is different. Think about future selection. When I have huge set of data, let's say medical data, and I want to make a decision about something, but I cannot use the whole set of data. There are too many of them, some of them conflicting. So I want to choose K features and base of them to make a prediction, but we do it. So I want to train my algorithm first. So from the previous five years, let's say, I collected data, features and labels, collect, correct labels. I have N of such a pairs. And now based on this N pairs, I want to train my algorithm and I have a class of predictor C. I want to learn what is the best class, what is the best function within this class that learn my uh, sequence. Let's say it is Fn, but then a new data, data, data comes. I will use this Fn prediction from new data. And I want to make sure that the loss that I incur is as small as possible. So this is the loss. I'm assuming that this data comes from some unknown distribution. And agnostic pack learning or pack learning here, let's say, I want to make sure that the loss for the function that I selected based on train sequence is not far away from the best optimal over the whole class with high probability. Okay, so that's what we'll do in, in online learning. There are different loss function. We mostly focus on logarithmic loss, so I, I leave it for later, but there are also uh, a misclassification probability or quadratic or some others, okay? Uh, we will use this misclassification later, but for now, let's move to more uh, uh, discussion about online learning. So again, let me summarize. I gave you this discussion, what is online versus supervised. Now I will focus on online. I give you some results of uh, a minimax regret, then an algorithm that achieves it. And then we go to supervised learning, mostly uh, uh, class uh, feature selection. Okay. So here the assumption that I'm gonna make. I'm gonna restrict my function f, my fact set of experts to basically a weight w that somehow characterize it. And this is a scalar product of, uh, of features and weight. I want to find the best weight in a sense this will be the best supervisor. Now I will do something more. I will restrict loss function to logarithmic loss, but in this equation, the most important part is here. Okay, so this P here is related to this and related to expert. So all experts in advance, I assume, are characterized by the logistic function, which is one plus exponent 
minus labels times the uh, the uh, the scalar product to the power minus one. This is how it looks like. This is logistic function. It simply is a continuous approximation to step function zero one. Basically, if I cut it here, I would say, okay, if if any value is on this part, I'm going to declare that the zero and minus one, otherwise it's one. But it's a continuous approximation. I told you why hat is a continuous function. Uh, weights are d dimension. Now, the problem that I explained to you, minimax regret, right now it's, it's simplified somehow. So Q is the algorithm that the best approximates whatever the experts will give it to you. And they have much more information than you. So I will be looking for the best algorithm. Or I will try to optimize over all possible algorithms Q. But this is algorithmic part. The expert is here. Now this F class and so on, I replace to a simple formulation and minimize over W of the logistic class. This is given to me in advance. Uh, it has nothing to do with algorithms. All the algorithms here, just to avoid algorithms first, what I want to do, I want to find the, a universal lower bound that is good for all possible algorithms. Like in information theory, when you do compression or universal compression, let me describe it for a second. Let's assume you're in a room that several people speak different languages, Polish, English, Ukrainian, Russian, Chinese, and so on. And, and you want to find a compressor that is good for all of these languages, and you don't know who's going to speak next, what language is going to speak next. So what you want to do, you want to find a compressor that is the best for the worst possible language. The worst language means the worst statistics. And we do the same here. Minimax regret for the worst uh, level sequence, I want to find, minimize over all uh, learning algorithms. And I want to see how this behave because this will give me a lower bound over all possible algorithms. Then of course, my job will be to find a, a constructive algorithm that achieve this lower bound, at least asymptotically, because I know I can do much better than this. Notice that this is also lower bound for the regret and so on. Okay. So what I'm trying to do it is how this function minimize regret behaves. And then I will maybe try to build, uh, to construct an algorithm that is actually reaching this lower bound. So I know I'm pretty good shape. Now, this formulation is pretty hard to understand what's going on. And the reason that we do it, because in information theory, there is something called Starkov sum, which actually can solve this problem and give you explicit expression of what this minimized regret is. First, let me define maximum likelihood distribution, which is a ratio of supremum of W. This is not anymore distribution, but I normalize it, so I have a distribution now. And actually what I'm gonna do, my optimal Q star will be equal to this P star, which in principle I can compute, but it's complicated. That's not the way to find an algorithm. But still, I'm interested in the algorithm. I want to know the behavior of the regret. So look what's happened. That is, I repeat here, the definition of minimax regret. Now I'm gonna do the following. Okay, uh, first of all, super max commute. So I'm gonna express it like this. And now I'm gonna add and subtract log of such a sum, which is uh, the denominator here. Now you see this is already in P star. So this is the minus log is already here. Now, 
I can, because P star and QR distribution, I can show you that this is non-negative. So if I make Q equal to P star, this is basically zero. And the minimized regret is log of the star cosine, which is much more interesting and challenging computationally asymptotically. That's what I spent last 20 years analyzing it. So it is summation over all input sequence of a supremum of the probability. This is not any more probability. It has very interesting property, but we're not gonna dwell too much on this. Uh, I will, in the, in the books that I mentioned to you, the book that we're writing, there are many examples how to compute. Okay, so a little bit about previous work. Universal compression is special case when they equal one and the start of sum and this uh, minimax uh, uh, philosophy was this start with Davison. And we did a lot of work. Then when the alpha byte said this is large, the interesting thing happens. So you want to know uh, the relation between M and T for, uh, for the regret. Now, Multi-dimensional case, Bayesian algorithm started with Kakada and Gehr, and Shamir actually did good work, but only for logistic regression. We are basically trying to be here, and we formulated it at the minimax regret. In, in machine learning, what they do, they do this worst case analysis, and they try to find the regret for every y and x. We, uh, we, we, are very interested not only in the leading term of the expression, but the second term. Let me show you what's happened. Okay, so what we are able to prove. If my uh, <laughs> feature abundant for the dimension not growing faster, t to one third, we are recovering what most people expect this be in this case that the regret goes like d ham log t. But there is a kind of a constant, interesting one that depends on data and on t. Now, before we go on the expression, which is complicated, I noted that the first two terms do not depend on, on the x. So if I want to maximize over x, basically this stays. So for a special for logistic regression, which basically means the PW is given by this formula, it turns out that this constant is quite complicated. It's a, a multi-dimensional in, uh, integral over square root of uh, determinant of a matrix, which you see here is the scalar product, not scalar product, tensor product. So this is actually and D by D matrix. It is a nightmare to compute it. But what we managed to do it for special cases, when data is on a, a lie on a sphere or in a bowl, we actually were able to compute this constant that for large D, and you can see that they are growing like minus D and so on. And then we got pretty good and precise expression for the regret. Now, let me summarize, uh, and maybe I will go here because that's what we want to know. So what we show so far, that at least for the expert class being logistic regression, however, much bigger, we can prove right now, much more general result. The minimax regret, which is a universal lower bound, grows like d hub log t. So what will be the next natural question? And that what happened in universal compression too. Now I would like to find algorithm, a simple one, an implementable one, that actually achieve this lower bound at least the linear term. Because I know that and I'm doing something good. So this is what we're gonna do next. Okay, questions. Okay. So now I will try to give you an algorithm, how to update W weight. So actually 
uh, in a Bayesian kind of an approach, we can use stochastic gradient, very often you, the problem is it's, it's computationally expensive. But we, are, we will give you a heuristic Bayesian method that at least experimentally, we are reaching lower bound and we're still trying to find a theoretical justification for it, which is, which is a little complicated, but probably can be done. Okay, so here's what I will do. And if you want to read it, it is on Archiva, uh, the, the paper which we wrote, Low Complexity of Approximation of Distinct Equation for Spurs Online Learning. So I refer to most of uh, math there. Okay, this is the most important slide. If you understand this slide, you understand the idea. And once you understand the idea, the rest is just calculation. But, but you need to understand the blues. You need to understand the philosophy. So in Bayesian order, you don't compute uh, a concrete value of y hat prediction. You rather predict distribution. And based on the distribution, you make actually prediction about uh, uh, binary. So. For example, if I am able to compute the distribution PYT under XT, then for every T, my prediction could be if this probability is between zero and one, I will predict that the level is zero, other way I predict one. So the question is how to compute this. Obviously I can, since I have weights, that was is my expert class, I basically uh, weighted over W and I multiply by the prior that depend on T, which can be represented this way. So my goal is now to compute PT, but actually to compute PT, I have to tell you how to update prior or T. This is actually what we're interested in. If I have relatively simple rho t, rho, rho t and computed in updated form from the previous time t, I can compute t plus one, I can probably find a closed expression from pt and I'm done. Now, let's see what we need to, to accomplish this goal. First of all, this probability is from expert class I know then this is logistic regression. This is the expression for logistic regression. We call it sometimes sigma. And remember it grow from zero from minus infinity to one half at zero and, and to one at plus infinity. Now, the key is to compute, to find a good update for what t. So we call it diagonal posterior Q and I will explain that in a second. So you see, we want to know how to compute the next prior based on the previous one. So this is basically a good approach. We need to find a good approximation of PW under XT and one. Using Bayesian expression, you can express it this way. Now, remember this is logistic expression. I know how to compute this is PT. Now, this is rho t. So I find expression rho t plus one versus rho t. This I know how to compute. I need somehow able to compute this one, but this integral, and again, this is logistic regression. If I find a relatively sick, simple expression for rho t, I can compute this integral. In order to do, we're gonna make a crucial approximation that rho t is somehow normally distributed with a parameter that I don't know and gonna uh, uh, adjust. So here are my assumptions. First, rho t is approximated by a diagonal Gaussian. What does that mean by this? That every time t, w is a d-dimensional vector and each wi is basically normal distribution and basically product normal distribution. Second, which is less important uh, assumption, 
but it's, it, it allows us to compute this PT. I will, I will approximate logistic regression by a, by a normal distribution. So you see here, I draw logistic regression and in the spread uh, normal distribution, they're almost identical. This is, a, this is the error between very small ones. I do it because I want to have an easy way to compute this integral, knowing that this is normal distribution, and I replace this by a normal distribution. When I have two normal distribution, I'm at home. Indeed. So what we're going to do first? This is our first approximation, normal distribution. Now I want to compute for every time t uh, rho for every uh, component of W. So W t is basically the sum over all dimensions. But what I'm going to do? I'm going to compute update this rho t. For, for the for let's say for the ice dimension, knowing how I know to compute it from dimension one for dimension one two up to i minus one, or component at time t. So I will be going to t plus one for some component based on t of the other component. Therefore, I split this weight into two ways that I extract this ice component. Why I do it? First of all, I know the normal distribution. Second, I know that I, I want basically to find a simple algorithm that allows me to compute each component of rho t or rho w1, w, w, t. And I basically want to compute because it is product. I want to compute everyone separate. Now, I'm assuming, as I told you, that diagonal uh, that rho is normally distributed. So the only parameter that I need to compute is basically a w uh, expected value and variance. I will do it for every IT. First of all, once I have this assumption, I can compute precisely that P of T has this form. So I have an expression. You remember, I need it. So I tell you, I already know this one. I already know this one. Okay. So I'm now I basically have to somehow tell you how to compute parameters, two of them mu of t and rho of t plus one for the next part based on the previous one. And this is actually what we need to do. We need to compute this integral for each component. And it turns out that with the normal approximation, I can do compute this and I approximate it well. And here is the final expression. So again, I refer to what I showed you before. Rho i of t was equal, I remind you, 1 over pt, uh, 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 rho i t, you see it now I do with i, plus the, uh, the, the basically logistic regression. OK, this is still not clear, but we are almost at home. I have to tell you how to compute the parameters at t plus one of the i's component, which will be mu i and sigma i based on this. Now, it is, we're gonna use some thing which is called normal approximation. I'm gonna say, okay, let me go back. I'm gonna say that this is normal distribution with unknown parameters, and I will use this one. So let's see what's happened. So, I don't, I want this part, which I have explicit expression and I know everything. I want now to choose mu and sigma. The way we do it, we use something with this called Laplace method. I'm gonna maximize posterior distribution. I basically try to maximize over here. So I will choose mu t plus one such that it maximizes that part. And we get an explicit, almost explicit expression because this guy involves actually mutable t plus one. So this is an equation that we have to iterate to compute 
the next uh, T plus first, uh, um, um, first moment from the previous one. But if we'll apply some normal approximation, we can get even better. The same we can do with, uh, with uh, sigma. And here the algorithm. So I start, I compute my parameters. And now I will do it for every, when I get the next input, for non-zero uh, features, active feature, I compute T plus one, I compute mu T plus one for every component using Newton method or Tyler expansion and the same sigma. And this way I can at every time approximate my, uh, uh, my posterior or prior from which I can compute PT at every time and from which will allow me to approximate the best approximation for the regret. And the results are surprisingly interesting. So here is our result. Now, there are many other Gaussian uh, stochastic gradient and so on. What is important here? What is here? Here is time. Here is regret. So from the first part of the talk, you should know that the best regret that I can get is basically d half over, uh, over uh, uh, log t. Ba in this case, it's basically we want one half. This is also one half, we have 100 features, so you want about 50 here. And in fact, this is very close to 50 log t. The same here. We also did it for real uh, synthetic and creole data, and our algorithm actually is quite close to the predicted. So we want this ratio, the grade of a log t to be about d half, d of 100, so it's about 50. And uh, so this is experimental uh, result. We don't have a proof that this algorithm actually achieved it, but most of the uh, algorithm in this area, like variational uh, bias or uh, stochastic gradient, all of them use some characteristics. And I'm not aware of any good theoretical justification. So this is one problem that we might work on. Okay, before I go to next questions. I hope I didn't lose you guys. Okay, let me go to supervised learning. This is something new. So here is a different problem, okay? What we want to do now, I have a huge multi-dimensional data, medical data, let's say heartbeat of a child. And from this data, I want to make a decision about something but I cannot use the whole data. I have to pick up some features and based on these features, make prediction, the best way I can do. So there are a few issues that are important here. Some of these features are be correlated and I'm not, I want to get rid of this correlated dependent uh, features. Once I get rid of this, it's still I will have, um, let's say, 100,000 dimensional data. And I want to pick five, six uh, 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 components of this and make the prediction the best I can. So this is the work that we did with um, Moxon, uh, Jason, and Gil. This was in ICML and ISIT and will appeal also in the transaction. Okay, so let me remind you what we want to do at the supervised learning. I, I basically want to learn the class C based on the training data. And when new data comes, I want to apply the, uh, the, what I learn to this data such that I'm pretty much optimal. And I will look at two things. I want to identify all the dental future, correlated future, because they are not helpful. And then once I get rid of the redundant future, I want to uh, future selection. So there are two problems that we're gonna discuss. And in both problems, we're gonna use Fourier, Boolean Fourier approach. So 
So let me tell you a little bit about it. You know very well probably about Fourier we use image, images and so on and so on. We're gonna do it on a Fourier function. So I have a function from plus minus one to R. And we know that it could be uniquely described as a product of some number plus something that is called parity. Let me see. The parity is basically for uniform, uh, in the uniform case, it's basically product of excellence. In in a non-uniform with non-uniform case, we have to unbias it, but it doesn't matter. What is important? This is easy to compute. We are, want to know how to compute this coefficient, and they are computed like in Fourier. It means that the product of g and x over all x. So this is good. This actually will uh, allow us. Uh, to uh, find the uh, Fourier expression, hopefully of a polynomial or long or, or low degree, that will approximate well the function with the predictor here. Now the problem is, of course, that this is unbounded. We need to do it for uh, correlated futures. In correlated future, we still have the unique expression. There is some parity. Think about it like this, but maybe bias. So xi minus the mean divided by sigma, or maybe something more complicated. I'll show you in a second. This is the Newton, this is the Fourier coefficient that I should be able to compute empirically, replacing this expectation by basically some mean expression. By the way, I'm gonna sum it not for over all possible subsets, but I only said for non and future. So I have to give you a rule. How do I find this tau? And so there are two issues that, two algorithms that I want to describe. One, how to find this redundant future using Fourier. And second, how to find this one experimentally. So I can estimate the predictor. I can give you a predictor. That's what you want at the, at the but we want to uh, 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 we want to actually work on both issues, et cetera. Okay. So here's an example. If I have an or function, here the Boolean function, for uniform distribution, this is a Fourier expression. If you have bias one, it looks like this. It's a it's a relatively it's a polynomial uh, of degree two, and uh, this should help us to actually uh, find the good predictors. Okay, so let's go and find relevant features first. So what does it mean? For example, some features might be correlated to the other one. Actually, the only uncorrelated feature is J1, JK. We call it K junta. Every other feature is a function of this K junta, how to find it. Or it might be more complicated. This is linear, it might be non-linear. Can we do it? So there are some methods. And what we do here, we use Fourier and a little uh, information theory approach to find a correlated feature. Here's our definition. So this is the first thing. So I will say, the subset J of size K, J1, J2, K, and JK is sufficiently informative if the entropy compute based on this K uh, component is the same as the entropy of all the whole set. Of course, that is unrealistic. So we say, okay, absolutely sufficiently informative if this entropy compute on this J component close, epsilon close to the entropy. That's what, the, that's what we want to do. That's how we decide whether, uh, whether the future are relevant or not. Now, the problem is, of course, that we have uncorrelated the dependent future. So we need some Gram-Schmidt organization first. So first of all, I have to consider all subset of this, empty one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. And I have to find for each subset uh, uh, 
uh, in a, in a, uh, we need to compute this uh, parity function but the, for the organization. And the idea will be the following. Uh, Nonlinear redundancy will be measured. How big is this, uh, the norm two of the J's component, so like this, like this, of this function? How we can do it, implementation? We, instead of consider all subset, we consider only subset up to size two, okay? Then using uh, uh, covariance, and we can approximate the second norm, that's what we want to compute, using basically this recursive algorithm. That's how we did, and it turns out that we can prove the following statement. Uh, J epsilon, so the relevant future are all such that, the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, psi of i, the second norm is greater than epsilon. And that's what, how we're gonna compute. Uh, so we need only to estimate this, and I show you how to estimate this one. And here, by the way, is experimental the justification for this. We have 30 features. The first 10 are uh, independent, everything else are dependent. And you see here is our Fourier approach that basically claims with accuracy 80% that the number of uh, relevant features about 11, 12, which is 10. The others are worse. And what is the most interesting part is that this future, we have also no linear and random that most of the algorithm uh, that are or reasonable complexity, so not corner kernel method, actually is good to predict linear redundancy, but not linear now. And then we actually applied for real data and we get quite good results. I'm gonna go quickly. So now supervise future selection. Okay, so what is the problem? Okay, I get rid all of this redundant feature. I have only good features of very high dimension. Think about this. I have a Boolean function of 100 variables. F of x1, x2, x100 that at the end gives me zero one, but it doesn't matter. I want to choose only five variables, let's say number three, four, five, six, and seven, and approximate the value based on this K future. This K is called K junta. So I I'm approximate a complicated function based on selecting only, so reducing the dimensionality of the problem. So I want to choose this J as small as possible, such that it maximize my error, okay? So it turns out that I use future selection, but you notice that I'm computing this over a subset of J. This is a coefficient that we can approximate algorithmically, this is, from Schmidt Graham optimization parity. I want the best, we can prove that the best error, the best loss is by maximizing the first norm of this function f. So the, the way to select it is somehow experimentally, numerically, find j stars that maximizing this. There are, of course, some problems, but. Here what we do. So we want a good approximation of this. Okay, let me remind you, parity check is this one. This is my approximation of coefficient. This is projection function. And I will approximate this by another uh, quantity. I, we have to do it because there is some bias but we want unbiased estimator. So basically we want that the expected value of M is equal to F. Then we have to subtract something. But basically if we do it, we can prove that if we do this, probability of error misclassification 
is very close to the optimal with basically the error is squared of n for a small k. And here some experimental data. And we did quite well. Any question? Okay, two topics to go. So uh, let me insert a little bit of ag agnostic learning. So you remember, this is a pack learning that I told you. We basically want to find an algorithm that is within epsilon distance from the optimal with high probability. Now, in agnostic learning, you want to find your algorithm, a class of, we can learn agnostically a class of H, if the misclassification is indeed not further than epsilon from the optimal probability, but the coefficient in front of P is one. So this is agnostic. If it is A, it is not agnostic. That's how we're going to look at it. Now, in the previous part, I show you that <laughs> that you see, in order to find this, we have to do it in L1 norm. L1 norm is not the best one to uh, compute computationally. So what do we try to do it is to see if we can find the algorithm that I show you to you, not in L1, 2, but L2 norm. So here is, and this is a paper that that we did with Smox and, and someone somewhere. So let me tell you L2 polynomial regression. So I want to find a K an a, a K degree polynomial approximating the best predictor. So again, I have N samples and parameter K. I want to find the best algorithm of degree K that minimize this, use least square probability, okay? Uh, least square method. Actually, there is the additional parameter theta that I want to find theta that minimizes the distance. And my predictor is basically sine. So plus minus one. This is L2 approximation because of this square. This is much easier to compute than L1. And we can prove, and this is recently, that actually it is agnostic. All previous have here eight, seven, I will show you later. With more, we can do the same L2 regression based on Fourier. So again, given samples, I predict, I first compute the coefficient that I told you before. I compute the, this function and my prediction is sign of this projection. Every element here is computable. And we again can prove that the diagnostic with coefficient one. Here, what was no before, it was eight, two P for a low degree polynomial. It was only known for L1. So this is the first time that we can prove actually that there is a good L2 approximation uh, and agnostic one. Okay, what else? Let me finish with a very brief introduction to quantum classification that uh, we will have several lectures on quantum in two weeks. Dr. Padakandla will give you an introduction to quantum and then a little bit uh, more. And then Moxon will give you one or two lectures of actually classification. But here, what I want to say. In today's world, you have to go into quantum and understand quantum data. Even classical data, uh, sometimes it's good to uh, explore it through quantum data. And it appear everywhere. The problem that this is the work that we did with Moxon, so you can look at this on my web and so on. Here's the formulation of the problem. Photon or quantum uh, 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 or quantum particle uh, uh, is in quantum state, but, and we have several of them, like in supervised learning, but what we want to know whether this quantum, this photon is entangled or not. So it's a binary classical classification, zero one, entangled or not. Entangled means that you cannot split the, the tensor product of the zero, zero. They are, must be together. So there is quantum classical uh, machine learning. 
or uh, classification. And that's what we want to do um, using a, a, a quantum uh, rules, non-cloning and so on. And uh, there are some methods to do it, mostly tomography, that actually you want to learn quantum state, which is difficult. We reduce it to much simpler. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna use this Kuta approach. Remember, when we have a Boolean function of 100 variables, I want to choose five of them and approximate. We're gonna do the same here. Uh, uh, quantum stay in a very high dimension, let's say dimension 10. I'm gonna project it on dimension two. And based on this, I'm gonna make prediction. And we actually this experiment, uh, you can see that, uh, that we actually based on, we need much smaller K, basically around two and three, instead of dimension, uh, uh, as, as, instead of 10. So we can reduce dimension 10 to two and we are getting pretty good accuracy in predicting whether uh, a font, well, let's say photo is an entangle or not. Uh, Moxen is working on a problem with dark matter and there is also a binary classification whether, so whether uh, particles are so-called axion or not. We don't have regard that. Now, let me finish and to tell you why it's related to everything what I say and Moxen tell you more. Right now, when instead of computing predictor, it is basically a measurement, but we use Fourier, except that this parity check the poly operators, complicated things. And basically the algorithm is similar to what we have before. We have to compute the predictor, measurement predictor and quantum predictor. And based on this, we uh, construct two projected operators, pi zero pin one that you can measure. And based on that, this is our predictor. And that's how we compute the, 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 the thing that I show you. This result is basically, in summary of the slide that I show you, is basically this. Moxon spent probably 10 slides to explain to you later. Okay, I think, I think we spent enough time on this one, let me okay, stop sharing. And now if there are any questions, shoot. Did I 